The construction of the so-called Mulberry Harbours was one of the technological miracles that contributed to the success of D-Day and the subsequent Battle of Normandy in June 1944. It was Sir Winston Churchill who realised the need to build an artificial harbour in order for the invasion of Europe to succeed during World War II. As a Navy man with decades of experience and as previous Lord of the Admiralty, he knew too well what could go wrong during the beach landings. He had seen that at first hand at among other Gallipoli. Here we are, together, defending all that to free men is dear. On the 30th of May 1942, Churchill drafted a memorandum headed Peace for Use on Beaches, which set out the problems with artificial harbours and insisted not to argue about the predicted difficulties. Especially the differences between high and low tides in the north of France, with sea height differences of 8 metres between ebb and flood, plus the fact that the sea retracts for more than half a kilometre during low tide, would make it almost impossible to unload goods during the whole day. Instead, the conditions for such would only allow goods unloading during two narrow windows, each of about one hour a day. Young engineer Alan Beckett designed most parts of the artificial harbour. If you're going to make an invasion on a beach, you've got to get it right. The highly secret project was dubbed Mulberry, probably inspired by a mulberry tree that grew in the back garden of his house. Many different types of structures were designed to give the mulberry harbour shape each with weird names like whales, rhinos, phoenixes, beetles and spuds. One of the main objectives was to construct a harbour that would be protected against the forces of the sea, especially during the frequently occurring storms. This protection was achieved by constructing a breakwater consisting of caissons, so-called phoenixes, and old ships that were sunk in a semicircle with a radius of about 2.5 kilometres around the small French seaside town of Aromanche. The wall stretched from the north of Mont Vieux in the west up to Asnel, east of Aromanche, opposite Gold Beach. These old ships consisted of 61 so-called corn cobs that sailed from Britain to France under their own steam or being towed before being scuttled. Mulberry was to become a partial floating harbour consisting of the already mentioned artificial breakwater, so-called bombardons, beachheads and mile-long floating bridges consisting of pontoons, so-called beetles, connected by bridge elements, so-called whales. At the beginning of each floating bridge would be a pier head that rested on the seabed using adjustable legs, so-called spuds. The height of the pier heads would automatically adjust with the tides. Each floating bridge or pier was about 2 kilometers long, consisting of just over 40 whales and the same number of beetles. In total 16 kilometers of whale roadways were constructed that way. The outer breakwater structures that created the artificial harbours were called gooseberries. Hopefully you will have been paying attention because all these names will frequently pop up during the rest of this documentary. In total all the objects that were part of the breakwater formed an 8 km long arc structure. The concrete Phoenix caissons were equipped with anti-aircraft guns and protected from low-level bombing by means of barrage balloons. The first Phoenix was sunk on the 9th of June. The gooseberry was finished by 11th of June. 
It only took about half an hour to sink a phoenix. It was just a matter of correctly positioning the phoenixes and then opening the slides to fill these caissons with seawater. By the 18th of June two piers and four pier heads with the aforementioned spuds were in operation. The harbour would have three entrances at the east, west and north, which simply were openings in the Gooseberry Breakwater wall of Phoenix Caissons and Corncob sunken old ships. All required equipment was designed and built in the United Kingdom. Huge docks at Southampton were used for that purpose as well as many construction facilities at Marchwood Military Harbour, at Leapy Beach and along the Bewley River adjacent to the New Forest. Up to 40,000 people were employed to construct Mulberry components. Hardly any one of them knew what they were working on. Especially the purpose of the Phoenix Caissons could not easily be derived from their shape and construction. No one would expect that these huge concrete structures, 30 meters high and weighing 6,000 tons, were intended to float, let alone be tugged all across the channel to France. Although the construction was an all British effort, the actual deployment of the harbour was split into two projects, named Mulberry A, run by the Americans, and Mulberry B, by the British and Canadians. Mulberry A was assembled at Omaha Beach, and Mulberry B at Gold Beach. Two weeks after D-Day, on the 19th of June 1944, a severe storm hit the coast of Normandy, which lasted for four days. As a result, the American Mulberry A harbour was largely destroyed, whereas the British Mulberry B survived. 
Here are some spectacular shots of what happened to the bridge elements and the Phoenix brake walls. All that remained were twisted heaps of steel. In total 21 of the 28 Phoenixes were destroyed. The Americans decided to abandon Mulberry A. Some parts that were somewhat usable were towed to the British Mulberry B side, in particular to be sunk in order to strengthen the Phoenix's brake walls. One may speculate why one harbour survived and the other didn't. Some historians claim that Mulberry A to the west was more exposed to the forces of nature. However, another important fact should not be overlooked. Mulberry's designer Alan Beckett designed special lightweight anchors that were intended to keep each bridge element in place. British engineers made every effort to ensure that these anchors did their job and were tightly dug into the sand. The Americans on the other hand did not take this too serious. Instead of using an anchor for each bridge element, they only deployed one for every sixth element. Also they mixed 60 and 80 meter bridge elements at random. Probably a certain element of rivalry came also into play, challenging American and British troops to have a contest of who would be the first to finish their part of the Mulberry Harbour. These mistakes turned out to be fatal for Mulberry A. General Eisenhower was compelled to abandon its use. The Mulberry B Harbour remained in operation for 10 months, although it was originally only intended to be used for 3 months. During this time it was simply renamed to Port Winston in honour of British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, who was the original creative genius behind the plan. 
One may wonder whether the floating piers and spud pier heads were really necessary. Fact is that the Americans continued to unload goods on Omaha Beach using landing craft on wheels, so-called ducks, and by using smaller vessels that took their goods on board by cranes from the large cargo ships. More than half of all the goods were brought on land this way. Thanks for watching and don't forget to subscribe to my channel.